live from the heart of the Blue Ridge, Roanoke, Virginia. It's the Just Bernard Show with host Bernard Alvarez. Uh, Walter is an amateur theoretical archaeoastronomer. He is the author of The Binary Theory of Procession. He is the executive director of the Binary Research Institute, where he researches the celestial mechanics of the procession of the equinauts, as well as myth and folklore related to this phenomenon. He is the writer-producer of The Great Year, a PBS broadcast documentary, which I'm going to watch after this show. Uh, it explores uh, evidence of astronomical cycles of time known to cultures throughout the world. Uh, Walter is an author. He is uh, a part of the CPAC conference, which we'll be speaking about today, uh, and uh, wrote The Lost Star of Myth and Time. So welcome back to the show, uh, Walter. It's been quite a while since we've spoken. It has been, yeah. I forget when that was, but uh, there's been a lot of changes since then. I'm sure. I'm sure. God, I think it was about three years ago, perhaps. <laughs> But um, so anyway, let's let's jump right in because a lot of people. I, I think I, we need to clarify uh, some of the the jargon that we're using. I, I believe actually the last time we had you on was around 2012 when the whole Mayan thing was going on and people were very into the procession of the equinox and the great year. Uh, First, is there a difference between the jargon of procession of the equinox and versus the great year, or are they one and the same? Uh, they're one and the same. You know, the great year was the term that Plato used for it when he referred to it, and some other ancient cultures. And and for good reason. You know, um, we all understand the cycle of uh, day and night. You know, it actually changes our consciousness. We go from subconscious when we're sleeping to conscious when we're awake, and it's all due to the rotation of the Earth in relation to the... Uh, electromagnetic spectrum, the light from the sun. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet we don't think much about this uh, miraculous change just because it's so common. We, we do it every day. Yeah. And then there's the second uh, motion of the Earth. The Earth, of course, uh, going around the sun at a slight angle over one year, and that causes the season. And again, you have dramatic changes. You know, millions of things migrate, spawn, hibernate, uh, and then billions, uh, trillions of things just, you know, pop out of the ground, bloom, give their fruit and then decay again. And there's this massive cycle just due to the motion of the years, you know, the earth going around the sun. And, uh, so it's, it's an apt or appropriate name that the, uh, the great year, which is in you know, a one procession of the equinox where the sun appears to go through all the different constellations of the zodiac and get back to its beginning point and takes roughly 24, 26,000 years at the current rate. Uh, and again, during that period of time, according to myth and folklore, there's these dramatic changes that take place on earth. And, and as we mentioned, Plato, he, he broke it into the iron, bronze, silver, and gold. well known for the Greeks, these different epochs of time. Um, so yeah, I like the, the term, the great year. It's, it's simple and something we can relate to easily. Yes, me too. Actually, that's, it's a lot easier to say than procession of the equinox as well. <laughs> so, yes. uh, so when we're talking about, uh, this great year, what you just explained, this is basically what, what was being focused on when we were talking about the Mayan calendar ending. Is that right? Yeah, so, you know, the Mayan uh, culture was uh, uh, only left us a very limited number of, of texts. I think they found uh, four or five at, at this point that are, um, you know, somewhat meaningful. And you know, one of them has talked about the, the end point in, in one of their calendars. It, it wasn't it, one of their mid-range uh, calendars. And so a lot of people said, well, what does that mean if the calendar is ending? And, uh, yeah, you had quite an uproar about it, as you know. And, uh, of course, you know, we have a uh, calendar end every single year, and we celebrate it with New Year's and blah, blah, blah. But we don't. We don't. We just then tack on another year. In, in their case, they actually would start over. And so uh, I think people read more meaning into it. And, 
And there's some some still today that says would say that a great change took place. Uh, but uh, I would say the change is sort of ongoing. You know, the according to the, the the Greeks or the Indians, they called these instead of iron, bronze, silver, and golden, they called them the yugas. The uh, yes. and we went from the Kali Yuga to the Dwapara Yuga, uh, roughly during the Renaissance period. And boy, you could see a pretty good change there. You know, we went from this really material mindset and, uh, you know, people lived very short lifetimes and knew nothing about finer forces like molecules and electrons and magnetism, et cetera. And then uh, you go through the Renaissance and boom, there's this explosion of knowledge and we're all living, you know, probably twice the age that we did before the Renaissance. And, and uh, there's considerable more knowledge. So sometimes these changes take a while to see, and maybe we'll look back and say, ah, 2012 was a turning point. But right now it is difficult to, to identify a change with, with that. And there is, uh, you know, a specific change that took place roughly between 1700 uh, and 1900 in the great year. Oh, okay, cool. And, and, with this, uh, I guess this way of calculating time or calculating the great year, is, is it was it fairly common for some of these more advanced ancient civilizations to to see this? And do we know how they saw it or how they calculated it or how many civilizations actually knew about it? Yeah, so there's a wonderful book. It's called Hamlet's Mill, uh, written by Giorgio de Santiana. He was the former professor of the history of science at MIT and uh, also a visiting professor at Harvard, you know, very excellent scholar. And his co-author, uh, Hertha von Decken, um, I think that's how that we pronounce her last name. She was uh, at the German uh, University of Frankfurt uh, and uh, anthropologist. And so they checked out... Uh, Giorgio was looking for the origins of science and teamed up with uh, Hertha at uh, uh, 40 cultures. Uh, and in over 30 of them, they found a knowledge of the great year where they would actually, you know, track the procession of the equinox in their uh, sort of myth and folklore, star lore, really, um, or they would make a reference to it and um you know about a higher time or a, a great age and and then they were commiserating <laughs> the lower times they were going in when many of these uh myths were written and so yeah over 30 known to over 30 ancient cultures and it was it's worldwide it goes from uh polynesian cultures to obviously the, the greeks and the indians are sort of the wrote the most about it that is, is at least preserved today, uh, but also known to the Egyptians. They called, you know, the golden age Zeptepi. Oh. Nordic cultures too. So you have a worldwide phenomena. Isn't that amazing? And it's amazing how we seem to have forgotten and are remembering all of this. And um, so I, I wonder, Walter, what, what type of, influences do we feel these ages are causing or actually let me ask you according to maybe one of the the paradigms what age are we in right now sure so um you know just as we measure the the calendar we have a a, a day and a year for it uh so in the in the great year we have uh you know a, a period of several sort of ways to look at it but uh generally speaking we're uh we came from the lowest age the dark age which was the kali yuga in the procession cycle around the time of the renaissance and so there's like a little uh, dawn and uh, dusk to the the change if you will they call them sandies in india um so it started around uh you know late 14, 1500s, uh, it officially took place about 1700, 1701, something like that, uh, which works very neatly with the discovery of electricity. And then it was completed by about 1900, you know, in 1905, uh, 
Einstein is uh, talking about, uh, you know, theory of relativity um, and, you know, discovery of atomic energies. And so we, we go from a time, the Greeks would say, a really material age, the age of man, when you only have a, an idea of what you can physically uh, find through your senses, you know, and so things are thought to be really solid and uh, we're, we're, we're bodies and that's it. And um, to a time where, wow, everything's made out of molecules and molecules are made out of atoms. And if you look closely, everything's made out of energy. And uh, so we've sort of completely changed our mindset from a scientific standpoint, going from one age to the other. And of course, that's supposed to happen again in another roughly a few thousand years when you go into a telep- telepathic age, which the Greeks would call the, the, you know, the silver age, the age of the gods, because right now we're in the bronze age, the, the age of the hero. Uh-huh. And then, of course, the golden age after that. So, yeah, there's very descriptive language for it now that you find in the folklore. That's really interesting. And I can't help but wonder, you know, we, we, we see it all over the Internet. I, I work with this concept that, you know, humanity is going through this great awakening, uh, whether it be through the influence of, of the planets or the, inf- uh, the influence of these time cycles. Is there anything to reflect that in any of these uh, any of these calendars that we're going through some type of global awakening of consciousness? Uh, yeah, and so it's it's as we go from the the lowest age, the dark age, the iron age in in to the Greeks, the Kali Yuga to the Indians, um, you know, the other cultures had different names for it, but there generally tend to be low, dark terms um, into sort of a, a lighter term that the world is, you know, supposedly the, going closer again to another point in space where it gets a beneficial type of light, just like the Earth during the, its daily uh, diurnal or its yearly annual cycle uh, gets more light you know, at certain times of the day or certain times of the year, in which case it's easier to be productive. Um, energy can be produced. Plants can, you know, to produce photosynthesis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are real things happening that are sort of quickening and making things better. And then when there's less light, uh, the opposite is true. And so, yeah, and I, I think, though, that society just... Uh, you know, the accepted creed is, is myths are simply that. They're just myths. There's no truth to it because we really, astrophysicists haven't yet discovered a third cycle beyond the Earth's rotation and the Earth's uh, revolution around the sun. They've kind of used a solar system model, even though many now start to believe it is this solar system does move we can get into that a little bit later yeah but um but yeah there's uh and so when people don't have a cause a reason why a thing would be getting better they write it off to myth and folklore or they say oh that's just evolution and yeah evolution might be quickening in some areas but you know it's pretty bumpy otherwise <laughs> right uh, but i i agree i i think you know golly you look at any field of science over the last 50 years and it's like you just throw out the old textbooks because so much knowledge has been acquired yeah it's very look true. at technology you know i think of that technology is sort of a, a manifestation of our creative thought and you know there was a time we didn't have you know televisions or or, uh, you know, iPhones or computers or anything like that. And, and it was uh, uh, obviously a, a simpler time. And um, mankind can be much more creative. There's many more occupations. And um, this is the age of the hero we're in, according to the Greeks. And I, I kind of like that term for it because many people are doing many more things and sort of breaking out of, old ways where you just work for a big company your whole life and that was it 
Oh, yeah, and we can see that everywhere. People are, are well, they're breaking out of the box, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, and so what? what is your study, uh, Bernard? Just remind me what leads you to uh, perceive that we're going through some sort of change there. Well, mine was more, how shall I say, I went through a shamanic vision quest, and I just got all this information during the, uh, during the experience, and... Uh, for lack of a better term, these these beings were telling me, you know, this is the time. You know, there there are things happening, and uh, and I'm seeing it. I mean, we can see. It. I, I see the evidence of it everywhere, where people are, seem to be going through what I call the spontaneous spiritual awakening, uh, where they're seeing with clearer eyes, understanding the uh, the, the this three D paradigm that we're in is, is just that. It's just a, a construct that we can escape, so to speak, and elevate ourselves out of it through our consciousness. I agree. Yeah, you know? we, we, we seem to be much more aware, and that, that gives us uh, power and control over our environment. Uh, not that everybody exercised it, but uh, some certainly do, and, and uh, yeah, it makes a difference. It certainly does. So Let's, let's help more do. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's happening pretty quick. I'm seeing more and more and getting more and more messages. So I hope that's it. messages from people going through the experience. So uh, I, ha I have I have faith in humanity's yeah. uh, spontaneous evolution. <laughs> um, well, now, there is a little way to measure it. Oh, okay. um, you know, if if you wanted to talk about it in yes. sort of you know purely astronomical terms. So the uh, Precession rate uh, is by Kepler's laws, and you know he he basically was the first to notice and write a formula that all bodies in orbit will uh, are actually in elliptical orbits. Nothing you know goes perfectly circular around another object. Even our Earth, you know, we're, our closest point is 91 million miles. Our farthest point is 95 million miles. Um, so it's a slight ellipse, but most orbits are even more elliptical. And so when something is in an elliptical orbit, uh, when it's closer to its other object, it goes fastest just because that's when the gravity pull is strongest. And when it's farthest away, it goes slowest. And so the precession observable, we have you know, moving through the different constellations of Zodiac at a certain rate. That's measured by modern astronomers and astrophysicists. Now, they use a different method. They use very long baseline interferometry. These big satellite dishes you know, are looking at quasars, you know, beyond the galaxies. And they, they will say, you know, 10 years ago, the precession rate was 50.125 arc seconds per year. Then it was 50.2 arc seconds per year. And now it's 50.2 three zero one arc seconds per year so the precession rate is speeding up which means that the our solar system is actually getting closer to the uh the the star that it orbits and uh and if you think that the cycle is 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 driven just through the similar dynamics to the the daily cycle, the Earth's rotation, or the annual cycle, the Earth's uh, revolution. But this case, the whole solar system going closer to and farther from another point in space, it's beneficial. Uh, then you can actually measure it and say, oh, yeah, we're, we're speeding up, speeding up. And so we've been speeding up, uh, you know, roughly since, since the low point, which two stars are at their farthest point, you call it apoapsis and we're moving from apo apoapsis which took place really in the depths of the dark ages it was about 500 a.d you know basically all the great civilizations had collapsed uh, greece and rome and all the obviously egypt was in great decline and mesopotamia and sumer akkad babylon it goes on and on and on and even they shuttered plato's academy and in uh, 511, I think it was. And then, you know, quite a dreary dark age with plagues and people living very short lifetimes and no democracy of any kind, uh, you know, brutal, brutal times. Yeah. 
and then uh, the renaissance and people finally start waking up again and so but you can measure the procession rate during this whole period of time you know slowing before the worst point and then increasing after that it's very interesting and i'm so glad you, you shared that to put it into context on a uh, well i guess an astronomical scale um when when you mentioned we've only got about four minutes left before the commercial break but when you mentioned the the solar system is traveling around a central star and, and we've heard this terminology before is that what you're referring to in your book lost star of myth and time yes yeah so we think that there's just a, a natural cycle um you know in fact when I was a kid, it was thought, you know, a small number of stars are in binary systems. So when you looked up in the sky, you see two stars close together, you figure it's just a coincidence, there's two stars close together. But astronomers realized, oh, the stars circle each other. And as telescopes have gotten better and we've, you know, cataloged the sky better, uh, we now know that about 80% of all stars uh, and there was a big jump in the last couple of decades because we've discovered brown dwarfs, very difficult to see stars. And so a lot of stars that were, you know, just didn't appear to be in binary systems or have companions now appear to have companions. And so, yes, that is part of it. Uh, we believe that our Earth has a companion star. And in fact, there's a bunch of people looking for it, including Mike Brown at at Caltech and the Spanish astronomers, and they've been coming out with findings lately. So maybe after the break, we can talk about some of those findings and what they mean. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, and, and just so ever so quickly to clarify a little bit, I learned something new. I learned something new in every show. But last week, uh, we had Patricia Ayan from the Comet uh, uh, School of Ancient Mysticism in Egypt. And she was talking about the differences uh, in archaeoastronomy and astrology uh, when we are looking at it from the northern hemisphere versus looking at it from the southern hemisphere, is it is most of the work that people do in this field or in your field, it's it's from the northern hemisphere. Is that fair to say? Uh, most of the people that I talk to, that's certain. Although the myth and folklore uh, comes from all over the place, as mentioned, uh, you know, in. in uh, India and Polynesia and Australia. Okay. It's all over the place. We've yeah. got a commercial break and we'll be right back and we're going to get more into. And now, back to your host, Bernard Alvarez. Welcome back to the Just Bernard Show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We are the number one listener-supported radio station in the world. And with that, let me welcome back Walter Cruttenden as we're discussing, well, many things about the procession of the equinoxes, uh, the binary star uh, theory. And on, on that, Walter, I wanted to... Um, I guess I just wanted to lay it out for everyone to understand because I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. So I'm looking at a chart of the cosmos, let's say, and we have the solar system and uh, at the top, so to speak, and there's a star in the middle and our solar system is circulating around that center star. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I don't think anybody understands the kinematics of it yet because it's takes place over a very long period of time, uh, you know, roughly 25,800 years at the current rate, but it, it will oscillate due to Kepler's laws. But um, yeah, we would appear to be moving closer to and farther from another star. And, you know, if, if you look at sort of the evolution of this thought a hundred years ago, it was thought the solar system doesn't move at all, you know, Copernicus had pretty much determined that. That was his theory he gave to us, the heliocentric system. The, the sun is at the center of the universe. Uh -huh. And then people started realizing when Mount Wilson was open uh, that, oh, you know, it appears that uh, solar system suns do, do move, but probably not very much, and so it's not worth tracking. And then um, as that 
evolved along, it, it's kind of realized, oh boy, there's a lot of stars in in binary or trinary or multiple star systems, and they're moving all over the place. And so um, there's a people starting to look at, okay, what's where's the solar system going, and what's tugging on it? And this, you know, this is a big, big question. Um, and the latest news uh, February this year out of Caltech is that there is something uh, really a massive gravitational pull on the Southwest side of our solar system, Southwest sort of underbelly, if you will. It's because it's below the plane of the solar system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and this uh, has been acknowledged, you know, by a bunch of astronomers now, astrophysicists. And so a lot of people are looking, and I mentioned near the opening that the Spanish astronomers have been looking, they were kind of the first to mention it. And they uh, think it has to be at least two masses, uh, each of them uh, greater than 10 earth masses. Uh, Caltech thought that's, that's crazy because we, we haven't even found one yet, uh, but it does have to be big. So Caltech did acknowledge it's probably greater than 10 Earth masses. Um, but what's really strange is that they have, uh, they've been looking now, and normally when they find a perturbation or something, uh, they, they find the object that causes it very quickly. And so... Uh, you know, in this case, the perturbation that was noticed was the dwarf planets, the not your big planets, Earth and Mars and Saturn, Uranus, etc., but the little ones, uh, Pluto and you know, Sedna and Eris, etc. All the dwarf planets seem to be dragged in a in a certain direction, and all have the perihelions or closest point to the sun, uh, neatly aligned. And so that's why Caltech came out and said, whoa, this is strange. This can't be coincidence. Something has to be tugging on our solar system. And so I wrote an article uh, that explains a lot more about it. It's, it's called What's Tugging on Our Solar System? And you can, people can find it at the Binary Research Institute. But um, it, it, I believe it's evidence that our whole solar system is being influenced by another star and and slowly pulled around and so the question then is of course what other star is it and i've talked to astronomers around the country i was up at stanford and they thought well since there's nothing obvious it must be a black hole you know collapsed star Mm -hmm. Uh, others have looked for a brown dwarf or even a red dwarf towards the galactic center where it would be difficult to see Um, but, uh, I'm sort of in the visible star camp and, uh, with the nearest star that's directly in alignment of the pole, uh, where the minor planets seem to be congregating. And, uh, so that, that leads us to the star Sirius, uh, Mm. which is, you know, eight, three solar masses clearly making the biggest dent in in local space, it's not the closest star. There is, there are a few stars closer, but it's the one that's, uh, it is very close to our plane, the plane of the planets, and it's just slightly below it. So it's, ex- it's actually 17 degrees below the plane, which is right where Pluto is. Mm. And uh, so all these minor planets seem to be pointing in that direction. And um, and there's a ton of myth and folklore too about Sirius, and it's actually yeah. the brightest star in the sky. So uh, and it's it there's some also some new news about uh, gravity waves. You know these were theorized by Einstein a hundred years ago, and uh, finally detected uh, just this year, early this year, by the LIGO system. And uh, it's believed that gravity waves are made by binary systems. And we can only pick them up from sort of massive binaries, you know, two black holes uh, colliding, something like that. Mm -hmm. But as our instruments get better, I think you'll find, you know, less uh, powerful binaries are creating them. And, And if you look, 
carefully at the Sirius system, it is a binary system itself mm -hmm. with Sirius A, the bright star we see uh, being um, uh, two solar masses and you know many, many, many times the size of the sun. And then Sirius B, which is the equivalent mass of the sun, but only the size of the Earth. So, you know, oh, wow. packing all, all that mass into a 10,000th of the sun. And, uh, and so it's every teaspoonful would weigh like two tons. Oh, it's, my gosh. it's a white dwarf. And so uh, this white dwarf goes around Sirius A, and we believe it makes a, a pretty significant gravity well, uh, and that those waves, while we don't detect them with a, a LIGO-type system, which are these high-energy systems that have to actually ripple through Earth, we do detect them by looking at the population of minor planets in the solar system, the minor planets being dragged out and, uh, and all pointing in the direction of Sirius. Wow. That's, that's very interesting, very fascinating. And I can't help but uh, notice, uh, as you're speaking about Sirius, that uh, there seems to be evidence that a lot of these ancient cultures, uh, a lot of their, uh, I guess like their megaliths and whatnot, some, I believe there was some research recently, uh, I forgot, we had the gentleman on the show, where they uh, were looking at the, the area of Stonehenge, and it was a representation of the, of the star patterns uh, with Sirius. Uh, I, I wonder how much of that is an influence in, uh, in some of the creation of these megalithic uh, places around the Earth. Yeah, we think that this might have been known, obviously, in higher times. Um, and so, yeah, I've heard of various references. I haven't checked them all out. I do know that the, the Shinto religion, the oldest religion in Japan, does actually align their uh, temples to the southwest, where Sirius, Sirius at, at its zenith, which is typically January uh, first, New Year's Day, so our, our calendars are aligned to it. Um, so the Shinto temples point to it, and they actually call it our second sun. Oh, <laughs> terminology ah. for it. Yeah. Very and, cool. And, and to the Egyptians, uh, you know, Sirius was extremely important. Uh, they called uh, it Isis, and mm -hmm. they often show Isis in a relationship with Horus. Uh, which is an aspect of the sun. Again, I don't think we understand all this iconography because, uh, you know, we we don't even believe that they knew anything about astronomy. Yeah. And yet here they build these fantastic temples that are beautifully aligned with the cardinal points. And they must have known something was going on. I'm telling you, I, I, I can't help but wonder how much, where they gathered this information. You know, it's like, was it like telepathic or was it visitors from other worlds or, you know, there's just so much, uh, so much exciting uh, uh, hypotheses there to go around, you know. Um, I hear you. With, um, well, that's so exactly what we're going to talk about at our conference on procession and ancient knowledge. This will be yes, our yes. 10th one this year. I can't uh, believe it's been 10 years already. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah so we bring together, uh, we'll have Robert Schock, the uh, geologist with Boston University, who's famed for redating the Sphinx, finding out that oh, yeah. it's much older than most people expected. He's uh, he's recently been investigating Gobekli Tepe, this amazing site in Turkey that would have been completely disappeared because it's over 12,000 years old, but it uh, was purposely buried for some reason like eight or 9,000 years ago. And uh, so it's just being dug up now. And because it was buried, all these uh, very fine bas reliefs are uh, still preserved. And um, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's some sort of a stellar site. Uh, and in fact, you know, the Zodiacs often only dated to about two to 3,000 years old to Mesopotamia. Uh, and yet on these pillars, which seem to be pointing at different constellations, you see a lion, you know, you see a scorpion, you know, like Scorpio and mm -hmm. uh, a bull like Taurus. And so there's pretty strong indications that the Zodiac is far, far older than uh, we ever thought it was. And, 
And, you know, that's just a way to sort of measure your, your orientation to the sky. So yeah. anybody that's really interested in the subject, I hope they'll just go to cpaconline.com. It's C-P-A-K online.com. It stands for Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge. And that's uh, you can see the full rundown of the speakers. Yeah, you've got some great speakers. I'm on I'm on the uh, Cycle of Ages page uh, on CPAC, and you've got Chris Dunn there. Uh, you got our buddy uh, Gary Evans is going to be back there again. It looks like John Anthony West, who's just fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and the uh, Dave Matheson, Scott Onstott. Scott wrote the book, you know, In Plain Sight. I think it's old. 5 million copies or something like that. And he's, uh, talks about how many of these uh, ancient structures, you know, embed, uh, great knowledge of advanced mathematics. Uh, and it's just, and it's been there all the time, but until we discovered the mathematics ourselves in the post Renaissance period, we didn't realize it. And yeah. so it's, yeah, it's us that's been missing the message, not that it wasn't there. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, and with that said, and this is like a personal question, I can't help but wonder uh, what, why does this, why do you find that this information is uh, so important for humanity? How can that help us? How can it relate to our, I don't know, our awakening or whatnot? What, what, what can we get from understanding this uh, procession and ancient knowledge? I think it's pretty critical, you know, we're, we're all looking for how we fit in, where's my place, what am I supposed to do when I'm on this planet and, and things like that. And, and, uh, individually, and yet as a group, as a population, uh, it's like we have amnesia, you know, we've forgotten key parts of our past. And so part of the teaching of the great year, you know, that we, we are these in the darkest age, you know yourself only as a physical being man. The next age you start to wake up and realize you're capable of really pretty much almost anything, the age of the hero. And you can be anything, any occupation you want to be, blah, blah, blah. And then um, to the age of the silver age, the age of the demigods where, you know, a lot of people are manifesting their, their spiritual side and supposedly telepathy is once again, common knowledge. You know, you get back to a pre babel age before what's the Bible say? God confused the tongues mm -hmm. uh, to a golden age. And then, and that's supposed to be our true state, but it's obfuscated through the, the, you know, the fall, the great fall. And of course the winter of the great year, the dark ages, and so we believe, you know, we're tricked into believing that we're just these weak little humans, you know, trapped in these bodies and we live for a very short period of time. We, there's just not much we can do. And woe is me. And CNN is right. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we're mesmerized by this stuff. I know. And yeah. And so the real deeper teaching of the great year is, man, we are gods. We have incredible capabilities. And uh, there is a way to buck the trend of the great year. You don't have to wait for the whole cycle. Just like, you know, on a cold day, you don't have to freeze. We have blankets and clothing and fires. And, or a cold winter, uh, you don't have to freeze or, or starve, you know, because there's all sorts of things we can use our intelligence to buck the trend. Likewise, you know, we can sort of grab under our higher self through meditation and yoga and just a lot of neat ancient practices that yeah. are coming back that lift the consciousness. And as you say, many people I do seem to be, uh, you know, displaying higher states of spiritual awareness now. And I, and this is a good thing. Absolutely. And it's funny, we, uh, this was the topic of our talk last week with Patricia as well, is bucking the system. We don't have to wait, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years that we could just like, just like you said, align with our higher self, expand our consciousness to, to evolve to those higher planes of, of awareness and, and whatnot. 
And I, I, I'm guessing, you know, is there, I don't know if there's a study for it or whatnot. Uh, we had a, uh, many years ago, we spoke with a Dogon priest here, and they were talking about, uh, of course, Sirius and whatnot, but they were talking about the influences of the energies of the planets, whether they be magnetic, electromagnetic, or whatnot, and how that affects our human consciousness. I was wondering if you know anything, if there's any studies out there on that. Um, there's there's certainly more and more people looking into it. You know, we've just, you know, just the last few years, we've figured out how to harness electricity and, and mm -hmm. electrons. And so we, um, and now we communicate right now with electrons and computers. And I mean, that's the way people don't even write anymore. Mm -hmm. The old Kali Yuga way putting something on paper and mailing it over land. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, we use electrons because it's faster and, and uh, more in tune. And so there, but there are other finer forces uh, that we are yet to discover. And there's hints at them. Um, for example, uh, the, the metals that are associated with the ages, the iron, bronze, silver, mm -hmm. and golden age, the, the precious metals of the higher age, silver and gold, you know, we value them more than the others. And we know that they have some, uh, some uses and purposes uh, in electronics, things like that, that are, that are better than mm -hmm. iron, for example. And, um, you know, in the higher ages, people wore these metals on their skin and bangles and, uh, and, and certain gems and they actually build churches, temples, uh, and, and thrones on certain lines of energy in the earth and then put a crown on their head, you know, and this mm -hmm. is where the whole royalty thing came from. Those, those that know and could pass down the knowledge. Um, of course it was debased in the, in the darker ages to be brutal dictators. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I think there's some, there's a higher knowledge to, to these subtle, uh, metals and energies, uh, and supposedly the planets resonate with them, but I, I'm no astrologer. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know how that works. I imagine we'll rediscover it in the next stage. I, I look forward to that. Definitely. Um, so the, the CPAC conference is on September. It starts on September 30th. Is that correct? Yes, it does in Rancho Mirage, California, uh, which is a really cool, peaceful place. It's out by Palm Springs, a little south of there. Okay. And so we'll take a hike to where the San Andreas Fault uh, comes up to the ground and there's an oasis there. Um, we'll do some stargazing at night where uh, David and uh, Juan and a couple of the speakers will sort of walk us through the night sky and what the ancients were looking at. And then during the day, we'll have, you know, some uh, great speakers. And Friday night, I guess we have some rock and roll music. And oh, great. <laughs> too. So, well, the Woodstock of ancient wisdom. I was going to say, it sounds like a celebration of uh, ancient knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're just trying to figure out how we can use this stuff to make a better world today. That's great. That's great. And um, so, do you do you plan on uh, do you plan on streaming it live online? I'm wondering, any of it, or do you put that uh, out afterward? Maybe. Yeah, I think somebody's working on that. Um, the person that helps us on all the uh, audio and and video stuff. And so, yeah, I hope he's got that done. But. I don't have a URL yet. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, we still got a few weeks. Hopefully we'll, we'll get that out and uh, we'll add it to the description of this archive. Uh, absolutely. But um, is there, um, is there like a cutoff point when people can register or just up until the date? Uh, up until the date. We even have a few walk-ins at the time. <laughs> it's always fun. Um, but yeah, they can go to cycle of the ages.com or, uh, cpacconline.com it gets you to the same place and and uh just register there that's the easiest 
Great. And and Walter, we're running out of time. Where can uh, people find you, find your latest uh, articles and whatnot? Where would you send them? So some of the most recent articles are on the binary research uh, org website. Um, the one about the gravity waves, you know, my field of study is, is more what's causing it. And so I'm really interested in the astronomy and the physics. Um, but we do, uh, there's, uh, some of the blog sites, the speakers too, you can find out uh, more about the ancient findings. Right on. Well, thank you very, very much for joining us today, Walter. That's wonderful. And we look forward to hearing more about the CPAC conference. Uh, everybody, next week we will have uh, Marina Jacoby, a conscious channeler, will be joining us live here on the Jess Bernard Show. Have a wonderful week, everyone. We love you. <laughs>